Good morning, and uh, thank you so much. I'm sorry for those who are ill, and um, we, we certainly miss those who are ill when they can't be with us. <clears throat> and uh, I just want to say, as a hospital, it can be devastating to um, those of us who are a little bit older and perhaps have other conditions. And I speak, I thank God that I have not had it and don't anticipate getting it, but I have dealt with uh, close by those who have had it and and um, are dealing with it. Our, our I'll just mention to you, uh, our son in uh, Tennessee works uh, for at Vanderbilt Medical Center as a surgical tech. He he has it, you know, and I'm and I'm grateful and thankful that he's done so well. But uh, would appreciate your prayers for him. So please take every precaution you can. I know it's very difficult to have to adjust something. I can't imagine what it means to those uh, who are involved in that group that's been doing that for 48 years. I can't imagine what that means to you, but it's a very wise step, I believe, under the circumstances and uh, will be beneficial in the long run. And you can always do that at another time and, uh, and enjoy it just as well. I'm going to be speaking today from Isaiah chapter 64. And um, we're waiting for a change, perhaps, in our national government. We're waiting for a lot of things. We're waiting for 2020 to end, and we're ready for 2021, and we're, we're praying, God, please, please bring us something different and something better in 2021. I know that's on your heart. It's on my heart, and, uh, and we're... You know, a little bit closer to us, we're waiting for Christmas now. We've got Thanksgiving behind us, and I hope your Thanksgiving was enjoyable. We were able to have uh, some of our, uh, almost all of our family behind us. We're, you know, just a couple of days away from December, and, um, you know, this is uh, traditionally known as the first Sunday of Advent, or a time of waiting, waiting for the coming uh, and the birth of the Christ child. And so um, we're in that, in that time of waiting. And so I want to just share with you some thoughts from Isaiah chapter 64, verses 1 through 4. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brush quaked at your presence. From of old, no one has heard or perceived by the ear. No eye has seen a God beside you who acts or works for those who wait for him. I'd like for us to pray together for a minute, please. Father, you bless us every single day and every minute of every day. You provide for us every day. thankful for these things. And our circumstances, Lord, has, have helped us to recall the things that really matter, the things of eternal worth and the things that perhaps we've taken for granted. So, Lord, help us to count our real blessings once again and to be encouraged by your love and your presence and your guidance for us. And we thank you, Father, for the opportunity to gather together in this place around your word and around the fellowship, even though our but temporary. And so, Lord, thank you for the opportunity of gathering together around your word. And may this be a time when our spirits are encouraged, our hearts are lifted up. And our connection with one another and with you is strengthened. We pray, Father, your special blessings on those who have tested positive. And we ask, God, that you speed their healing and their recovery. And we pray, God, that their symptoms would not be overwhelming. And we pray, Father, for continued protection and guidance 
And help us, Lord, and Father, help us to take strength and courage from this time of worship and the message that you have for us. In the name of Jesus, amen. When I was a, a little boy, I always loved this time of year. <clears throat> I still do uh, for different reasons. But when I was a little boy, one of the things that thrilled me was to go to the mailbox and see there the Sears and Roebuck Christmas catalog. And I looking across uh, this audience, I know a lot of you knew that the Christmas catalog had all kinds of stuff that I needed as a, as a little boy. You know, and I could go through that thing and mark stuff on just about every page and uh, communicate that to uh, the Santa Claus of my time and, <clears throat> and hope and pray that his pack would hold everything. Uh, I enjoyed that, but the hardest part about that, I, I, you know, looking through it, I would, I would come home from school and do my homework sometimes, and so, or sometimes I'd just head straight to the catalog just and make myself a glass of chocolate milk, get some cookies, and just sit there and read that thing and look, go through it. And, uh, and just in the waiting, you anticipate what's coming. You anticipate the good things that are coming. And I think this is, I, I just want to kind of set the stage for you as we look into this passage this morning. And really, I'm going to focus on verse 4. There's a lot in the other verses. And, and my goodness, isn't that the cry of our hearts? Oh, oh Lord, that, you know, that you would just step down out of heaven and you would set things right again. Not just, not just going back to the way it was nine months ago, but just to set the high point of the Old Testament. And, and uh, you know, it just depends on how you might feel about that. It's certainly, you know, you may see some other books as a high point. They're all great. Don't, don't misunderstand me. But, uh, but Isaiah is, is a marvelous, marvelous book. And Isaiah prophesies over a, 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 about a 64-year period, <clears throat> best we can determine. And the end of the, the, um, uh, the, end of the uh, basically the self-government of Israel and Judah, uh, as God had warned them over and over again, looking into captivity. And so Isaiah prophesies over this period, about four different kings uh, during that time. And, uh, and Isaiah gives some words, his own words of warning from God, of course. But then he also, there are those, those messages of hope and encouragement. In fact, Isaiah has more prophecy about the birth of Christ than any other uh, prophet in the uh, Old Testament. And so we, uh, we look at this passage today and, and look at the way that, that God is working. There was a, a young <clears throat> pastor, father, his family, he said, we don't trust in horses, we don't trust in chariots, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. He had a little toddler son, and that son picked up on that, and he repeated that. We don't trust in horses and chariots, we trust in the name of, a, of the Lord our God. And he went to church kind of quoting that. And after the, the, the service was over, he, uh, he would come down to the, to the front and he quoted that. He stood at the front like he'd seen his daddy do many, many times. And he quoted those off to get settled in our minds and in our spirits is that we don't trust in the things that we can see and the things that we've trusted in for so long we need to strengthen our trust and to put our total faith and trust in the name of the Lord our God. We don't trust in horses and chariots. We don't trust social media. I mean, duh. We don't trust, we don't trust our health. We don't trust our intelligence. We don't trust in our job. We don't trust in our abilities. We don't trust in political party and in our heart's affection as we make our way through our days. 
And here's the reason. And the reason that we trust in the name of the Lord our God is that God works for those who wait for him. From of old, no one has heard or perceived by the ear, no eye has seen a God beside you who acts or works for those who wait for him. Now, I want you to think for just a minute with me about ourselves. And we'd celebrate our friends who provided by working out all the things that we really need. And we would exalt people. We'd sing songs extolling people. But none of that's true. We don't gather together and exalt us. We gather together to exalt God whom we trust and who works for us. So here's a few questions. Did, did we work to be created? Did we make our eyes so that we can see? Did we supply the earth with water? Did we provide the atmosphere, the oxygen around this little blue marble hanging out in space? Enough air for birds and enough air to support all kinds of life? Do we paint the sunrise or the sunset? In other words, all the things that we need most and love best, we didn't do. All of these things that have profound influence in us, we didn't do those. We didn't make it. Our work is not the key. His work is the key. The truth that I want to leave echoing in curve from this verse one is the uniqueness of this God because that's the main point. Anytime that we're gathered together as a body of Christ, <clears throat> that's the main point, the uniqueness of this God. And then the second is the competence of this God who works for those who wait for him, for you, for me. And then third is what does it mean to wait for him because he tells us he will, I will work, he will work for those who wait for him. And so first of all, God's work, seen a God beside you who works for those who wait for him. No eye has seen a God who acts this way because there isn't one. You can't see one. And you can't, you've never heard of one other than God because there's, there's no other God like this. God is unique. There never has been a God like our God and there never will be another God like him. He's in a class by himself. He's beyond being classed. He's beyond being categorized. God doesn't neatly fit in anybody's box. And really is. And he doesn't fit neatly inside anybody's box. We all have different ways of understanding God and expressing our worship of God. And that's fine. That's wonderful. Because that expresses the different kinds of people that we are. But God doesn't fit in, in any of our boxes that we like to make him fit in. The uniqueness of the Christian God is that he doesn't ask people to work for him. Okay? The uniqueness of this Christian God, of, of our Christian God, is that he doesn't ask people to work for him. He works for them, and all of the service, all of our service is dependent on his service. That's the uniqueness of our God. In these verses, Isaiah 46, 1 through 4, Isaiah, uh, excuse me, uh, I'm, I'm going to refer to another passage in Isaiah. Isaiah 46 rather than 64. I was looking at my notes a little backward there. Isaiah 46, 1 through 4, Isaiah, mythology of gods, they would be comparable to Zeus and Mercury. These are gods with a little g, not actually gods at all. They're just interpretations of man's understanding of how things worked. And in Isaiah 46, 1 through 4, 
Isaiah's talking about Bel and Nebo. How are they different from Yahweh, the one true God? Listen to what he says. Bel bows down, Nebo stoops. Their idols are on beasts and livestock. These things you carry are born as burdens on weary beasts. They stoop, they bow down together. They cannot save the burden borne by me from before your birth, carried from the womb even to your old age. I am he, and to gray hairs I will carry you. I have made and I will bear, I will carry and I will save. I don't know about you, but that means a lot to me. It means a lot to me, especially since the gray hair started showing up. Okay. It basically means, you know, there's no other God but God. These other kinds of gods are useless and worthless. So how are they different according to this passage in Very rarely do I run across one of the patients on that list who, who don't have a faith foundation. So I expect when I go into that room, I expect that they have some understanding of what it means to be a person of faith. And, and all, invariably, what I will say in a conversation with a patient is that God is here with you. He's here with you. Right now, I mean, said, I, I know, I know, he's right here. I love the reaction either way, but I, I enjoy reassuring people, and I just want to reassure you, as May River Baptist Church, God's with you. He loves you. He cares for y'all, and he's aware of all of these challenges, and he's aware of the leadership that you have now, and he's aware of the leadership that you need moving forward. And, and, you know, he's, he's okay with some of the decisions that you've got to make. He understands more completely than we're doing. Bell and Nebo are being carried by people on their carts. All of the gods of the world except our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are a burden rather than our burden-bearing God because the way of salvation in every religion is work enough for whatever God it is, and maybe you'll make it. That's not Christianity. We have a God who works for us. And because he works for us, we can do whatever. I'm giving my time, my life to. I wish I was better at it. He exalts himself by getting down low and treating people better than they deserve. I desperately need a God like that. Because I, I, you know, I've, I've only got 69 years on this earth. You know what? Marion can't do it. I just can't. There was a time in my younger days when I thought I could. I thought I was going to be okay. I thought I was going to reach that point. And <laughs> you've got to trust him with everything. And that's the only way that you're going to make it. Now, that's echoed in the New Testament. Over in Mark chapter 10, if I can remind you of the story, most of you, are, I'm sure, are well aware of the story. And if, if you're not, that's okay. That's all right. I'm going to kind of share it with you this morning, but Mark chapter 10, we have Jesus and the disciples together, and, and uh, James and John, who are you know, fairly close to Jesus, they come to Jesus, according to Mark, they come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, we know things are kind of, you know, uh, and Jesus, Jesus said, well, you know, guys, uh, I'm not sure you understand exactly what's happening here, because are you, there's, there's, things that are developing, are you going to be able to do what's expected of you? Are you going to be, uh, the words he says, can you drink the cup that I'm about to drink? Meaning, this is going to be really bad. 
And, and they not thinking said, oh, yeah, we, yeah, we can handle that. We can do it. And, uh, and Jesus says, well, yeah, you, you are going to do it, although not indignant. They're indignant about it. They're very upset with James and John. Not, not because, not, not necessarily just because they went and asked Jesus, but because they did it first. You know, hey guys, you, you know we. <laughs> who do you think we are? What are we, chopped liver? So you know, we we have the same. We all we're all the same here together. So, so the disciples are indignant that they that James and John got to Jesus first. So, so Jesus calls his, his disciples together and he gives them a teaching in Mark ten forty one through forty five. And it says, and when the ten heard it, they began. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man, referring to himself, came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. So the world does greatness by how many people you've got under you. That's how the world, you know. How many Twitter followers? But, you know, once your friend, once your Facebook friends get up there, if you put out something on Facebook, hey, guys, I, I need some help. You can probably count on one finger how many are going to respond to you, to you really. So the world does greatness by how many people you've, you, you've got under you. But, but Jesus said it will not be this way among you. This is not what it means. It's not about Twitter and Facebook and, and TikTok and Instagram and whatever else there is out there. And Jesus says the Son of Man did not come to be served has a God like this. God is saying, I'm coming to serve you. And all you need to do is trust me. Will you trust me? Will you have me as your God? Or will you insist that you're going to work your way and get better and better and better and better? Which you can't do. God is unique because that's what this verse says. No one has heard or perceived by the ear. No eye has seen a God beside you who works for those who wait. So that's the first thing. God is unique. The second thing is God's work is competent. Now, I like competent work. I like when I take my car in to be repaired. I like competent work. Maybe, you know, and I've had some experiences where I had, you know, they've been not so competent work. I'll put it that way. I like competent work. I, I like to do competent work. Uh, sometimes I'm, you know, I struggle a little bit, but because his motive is that he's very passionate for the name of the company called God. If he's going to put his name on it, then he's going to fulfill his work to the best of his ability. And God will not allow himself to do anything but the best for the glory of God. Another reason that humans are incompetent is that they have a lack of wisdom or knowledge. They do their best, they just don't know enough. But God always knows everything. So he can't be incompetent because he knows everything. Now, you know, our problem is that when, when God is working, we have an idea of how, what the hell, oh God, that, you're, that you didn't like that. Just don't, I advise you not to stay there and understand that, that he really doesn't owe us an explanation because God is God and he already knows everything and he knows where everything is going. 
And another reason that, that we humans are incompetent is that we don't have enough strength. People may have passion. They may, they, they may know all that they need to know, but they're just not good at it. Their arms aren't strong enough. They're not able. But God is infinitely able. All the work that God does is perfect, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purposes. I don't know about you, but that gives me a lot of comfort when I don't know what the next year is going to bring or the next month is going to bring or the next week is going to bring. I will accomplish all my purpose. God never fails to accomplish everything that he said, everything I put my hand to because I'm God, he says. And then God works perfectly for those who wait. Now, remember that God does certain things for everybody. He causes the sun to rise. He causes the moon to shine and the stars to shine. He causes the rain to come. He causes the seasons to change. He causes the tides. He causes gravity. He causes all of this to work together as we talked about last Sunday night. That Jesus to walk in their own ways, yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. God did that. God does that. Anything, that, anything good that comes to your life, to my life, to the lives of our neighbors and friends, people who don't even know God, people who are living in, in far-flung countries who've never heard the name of God or the gospel of Jesus Christ, there's a witness there because all the any good thing that happens in their lives, in our lives, is from God. He's that kind. No eye has seen, no ear has heard of a God who works in a special saving, helping, strengthening, preserving, adopting, reconciling, joy, giving, eternal life, giving ways for those who wait for him. So what does it matter, or what does it, excuse me, what does it mean to wait for God? Well, first of all, it means to stop and pray. It means that those who wait for God don't go somewhere they don't, don't need to go. Isaiah would say, speaking to his strong, but do not look to the Holy One of Israel or consult the Lord. Now, what does that mean here in 2020? It means that we need to wait. We need to stop and wait and stop trying to figure out how this is going to work out. Stop trying to do what I can do to make something work out that God is already working on. Stop and pray. Not waiting for God is a reflex action. What can I do? Okay, here's a problem. Here's something that's come up. What can I do? How can I quick fix this? I, have to, I do what I can in my own strength without even thinking about God first. On God. So stop and pray is the first thing. That's what it means to wait on God. Second thing is to stand still and watch God work. Moses was leading the, uh, uh, the nation out of Egypt, they come to the Red Sea. Here comes Pharaoh's army behind them. So they're worried, they're concerned, they're beginning to think, oh, what, you know, okay, it's over, it's done. And, and uh, Moses prays and he, he says, stand, stand still and watch the salvation of God. And so God divides your mind, God brings those waters back together again and wipes out Pharaoh's army. Stand still. There was again, you can read that over and over again in the, in the Old Testament, almost right up until the time when both Israel and Judah were taken into captivity. There were times when God intervened and stepped in and said, just, just stand there 
and watch while I do this. There was 185,000 Assyrian army that were destroyed overnight like that because God intervened and wiped out that entire Assyrian army. Wait. To wait doesn't necessarily mean that you sit down and you twiddle your thumbs and you don't do anything. When you go to your doctor's office and you check in and you go and sit down, what's the first thing you do after you sit down? You pull out that thing. <laughs> or you find a, a seven-year-old magazine and start reading. You, you, you do something. You're doing something to use up the time because you want to you want to be somewhat productive or you you know that kind of thing. And there's that's okay. Henry Blackaby he said, when you're when you when you're praying and you're talking with God, asking for His leadership, and you don't get an answer, that means that you need to keep doing the last thing you know that He told you to do. And I'm I'm paraphrasing Henry Blackaby. But keep on doing the last thing that you know that he told you to do. Don't wait. Don't, don't just say, well, I've done that. I'm finished with that. Because, you know, God's work isn't ever done, at least our part of it, okay? And so when, when you're waiting, when you're pausing, when you're praying, keep doing, keep on functioning as deacons, as as Sunday school teachers and discipleship training leaders, keep on doing those things that you know God has led you to do until you get that next word from God. So pause and pray. Pause and pray. Stand and watch. And keep on doing what God has asked you to do. Isaiah 41.10, and I'll close with this. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I Extremely challenging, and when we don't know even what the next hour is going to bring, we can trust God that he's working for those who wait for him. And that's the important distinction 